o'clock. Let's start the meeting. Eight o'clock. Eight. No, no. It's uh, seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. <laughs> yeah, you try to pull a fast one. Huh? Uh -huh. Yeah. All right. Uh, this is the March Ale Club safety meeting for uh, April 2019. And uh, <laughs> Mechanic, our mechanic is talking to the base ops guy, making all kinds of noise back there. <coughs> David, yes, sir. Yes. Thank you, sir. Yeah, he's leaving. He's leaving. So. Jim, I'll talk to you later. Okay. Um, welcome to the safety meeting. I'm Roger Mann. I'm the safety officer, and the chief pilot sitting right over here, and. Uh, and uh, let's see, yeah, Randy here, he's uh, one of our instructors and for the T-34s primarily. And I, I don't think we have any other instructors in here for the Aero Club. Uh, um, my, one of my speakers that was supposed to be speaking tonight, I don't see him. Why? Well, anyhow. Um, okay, uh, tonight we're going to just jump right into some of our things that we can do. We'll get things a little faster because our air club manager is not here tonight. Yay. Oh, okay. So uh, he won't be talking, uh, but uh, if Mr. Marimoto wants to talk about something, he can. I'll let him. He doesn't talk very long. And John, if you want to say anything either. Um, so, all right. Now, new people, I want you guys to raise your hand. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, just quickly give your name and where you're from and, or, well, what are you in the club for? Something real quick. Just say, we'll start off with you. Okay, I'll start. Uh, I'm Charlie. Um, 30 years of air traffic control experience and Red Earth Tower. Uh, college professor, uh, let's see what else, aviation safety counselor, which is um, exotic male dancer. <laughs> One of those might not be accurate. Uh, I just moved here to, uh, two months ago from, uh, I was actually a controller at uh, Dobbins, uh, Air Reserve Base. Uh, I got checked out in the tower at Hawthorne. Uh, the drive from Pomona Hawthorne got to be too much, so I wanted to focus on flying. Flying out of uh, Chino right now and uh, working on a commercial instrument ticket. When eventually get checked out in T-34 and then uh, uh, get my flight charger so it gets taken care of. Was a safety manager at uh, Robbins Air Force Base when I was on active duty as well uh, for the Aero Club. Announced air shows, been air show air bosses, and uh, they live and breathe and sleep aviation. Stuff. Stop, stop. You're overqualified. <laughs> 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 yeah. I have an extended battery yeah. on that. Can you more time? I was kidding. Happy to be here, guys. Thanks. Thanks. Just don't say too much now. <laughs> You might get in trouble. All right, next. Uh, I'm Lucas. I'm from Florida. Uh, I'm here with the McCord team, and I wanted to get my pilot's license while I was here. Don't really know what else I want to do with my weather's license. better for it. Huh? The weather's better for it here. Definitely a lot better here than it is in Washington. <laughs> okay, next. Right. I'm Jesse, uh, originally from Texas. I'm also here part of the uh, McCord team. Um, I'm a security forces officer. I've been doing that for about five years. Prior to that, I was a uh, F-22 engine mechanic. Um, I'm going to try to get my PDL while I'm here uh, and uh, hopes to apply for the FY19 UPT board in September. Okay. So, yeah, all right. <laughs> uh, we're a group of like 300-something folks that T wide down here due to our runway closure. Um, so we're doing operations down here. Gonna have yeah, McCord is down here. They've actually kind of taken over our hangar, literally, uh, and they're there for 24-7. You know, they, they operate 24 hours because they're an active duty uh, unit, and uh, and even security forces even have, they got their people down here. So, you know, be careful. I've heard McCord security forces are really uh, tough on their feet. They yeah. shoot first and then ask questions later, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, next. Hey, my name's Eric. Uh, I'm a boomer. Across the street. He's been there for eight years in Oceanside, California, right down the road. Uh, 
obviously I work with a lot of pilots and I, and I see the iron scooter right now, so I figured I might as well opt in and capitalize on the opportunity. So I'm here to get my PPL. All right. There All is right. a pilot for right. Hey, next. All right. Well, there you go. Angelina from Texas, also part of the Spook Core team. I am a material manager, and I know you enjoy our company in the hangars. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> we really do. <laughs> start as far as the kind of the transfer the in Washington. We really do enjoy having you guys in that hangar. It really is. It's a lot of fun to have you guys. There's some people always around all the time now. Because sometimes, you know, when you T-34 guys aren't there in the office, it gets lonely. And you get, you know. <laughs> okay, let's see. Was there anybody else? I think we got everybody. Okay. Uh, okay, so we don't have anybody out there that's disappeared for several years and just came back. I think everybody's here. So, all right, next. Okay, new pilot ratings that includes solo flying. Okay, for you students, first cross country you had solo maybe. Uh, who's soloed for the first time? I know we've had some that's done it. I'm not sure if you're here though. It doesn't look like it. We had, we had uh, two, three of them did it just in the last couple of weeks uh, with Cliff. So, because he was trying to pump them out. Cliff is one of our instructors, and he's he, he's building his own airplane, and so that's where he's gone. He's he's getting some things done uh, that has to do with that airplane he's building, and so. He's out of town for at least a week, maybe two weeks. He's not sure yet. So, okay. Has anybody been busted by the FAA or anything? No? Okay. Well, I know it does happen. Experiences. Okay. Who wants to share anything that's happened to him? It, it can be anything. Don't worry. We don't have safety office in here that I can tell or anybody like that that might jump down your throat. We promise we won't say anything. Uh, but if, if anybody has anything to share, if not, we do have somebody that does. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead? Oh, you're looking at me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Need to t you need to talk about your mistake. No, no, you didn't. <laughs> you did a good job. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Reusable. <laughs> yes. To back up and run it. Yeah. Somebody take it out today. Works. Good. Yep. Got it started. Got started right away. Yeah. On the left boost pump. <laughs> has to be Oscar Echo now. <laughs> um, T34 this uh, past Saturday. Um, uh, Tyler Tricky and myself took uh, five. I took five six. And he took 5-7 down to Gillespie Field for the uh, Warbird, 2019 Warbird Expo, which was excellent. We had a great flight down, had my daughter in the back seat, which was fun for her. Um, <clears throat> everything was uneventful going down there, except for getting the airplane started out of here. That was one issue. Um, dead battery, or ran the battery down, and then got a jump start uh, from Transient Alert. Went down uh, to Gillespie, sat there for three or four hours, I guess. And uh, we were planning a, a six ship uh, flyby, a couple of flybys over the field. Again, I had trouble getting uh, five, six started. Finally got a jump start again. They were good enough to uh, uh, get a cart for me. And uh, But the other airplanes had already departed, did a couple of flybys. Um, there were two two aircraft, well, five, six, and you were in three, four, three, four uh, George's, George's airplane, went, went out, and I was supposed to take off and, and join up with them and head back to uh, uh, the base. I get airborne, uh, finally, and, and a bunch of traffic in front of me trying to depart out of there. Uh, took off, raised the gear, um, and about, Two minutes later, I looked down. I didn't check it immediately because I was distracted with the with traffic and then trying to get a hold of uh, the other two airplanes lead on uh, on the common uh, frequency. 
I finally looked down and I saw uh, the main landing gear was up. Uh, the nose and the right uh, main were barbable. So I decided to head north. Hopefully they could join up with me. We did communicate and they, they uh, I told them where I was. I was actually east of Miramar at that time, heading north back to the base. I went up to 2,500 feet um, and I recycled the gear, same indication. Uh, so I said, okay, well, it, this, is, uh, this is not good. I'll, I'll at least plan a flyby when I get back to the base, fly by tower and have them check it. Or have uh, Tyler in 5-7 uh, join, up, join up with me and check the gear. Then I started losing calm. It was the indicator lights uh, of the uh, number one comm. It only has one comm uh, radio in it. Uh, started flashing at me. So, um, and my daughter couldn't hear me talking to her in the back. So I'm going, oh, now I've got an electrical problem. I've got a uh, gear problem. I'm not going to be able to speak with or talk to Tower when I get back, or talk to anybody who joins up on me. So I started working that. I, I, I wanted to try to get the gear down first. I reset, uh, pulled the circuit breaker, reset that for the gear, same indication. Um, and I decided to reset the generator, turn the generator off, turn the generator back on, and uh, I got combat. So then I was able to talk to uh, the other aircraft, um, and he, he had already gotten up to the Lake Paris uh, area, and uh, so we were talking back and forth, asked him to join up on me, and uh, he did, check the gear, he said, looks like it's down. I said, well, you know, I've got the checklist out for, um, the emergency uh, gear extension checklist, and I said, I'm just gonna run through that. So it's in, in the T-34, it's a crank situation. 37 cranks to get the gear down if you if it's not down. So release, the, there's a button that you release and then you can crank it. As soon as I did that, it moved about a quarter of an inch and, and stopped. So it told me that the, the gear was actually down locked. Um, went ahead and landed uneventfully. I did clear, declare an emergency because I had two, the, the nose and the right uh, main gear were barber pole. <coughs> Who knows if it's gonna collapse or not. So went ahead and landed uneventful, uneventfully, met up with the uh, fire trucks and, and, and all the folks on the ground and uh, taxied in after that. Um, what turned out to be a great Uneventful flight down to Gillespie uh, turned out to be, you know, the you impressed your daughter and we're killing yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So, hey, maybe Dave, you can you can talk about what you found in the airplane. Yeah, what we found in the aircraft. Basically, on T thirty four is we do an end, we do a fifty hour inspection, a hundred hour inspection, we go through batteries on a hundred hour inspection and the annual inspection. And the T thirty four is very seldom do a hundred hours a year, so it gets once a year inspected. And, uh, Pulling the battery out, but like uh, drives the popcorn parts and the service back up and charged it. Did a gear ejection on the ground, put on jacks and everything, checked out real good. That could have been drive the gear, checked out real good. So basically, just that could go system on that. When the battery's dead, the generator just won't keep up with uh, the radios and the gear. So we did a perfect job on landing everything. Yeah, that was my Saturday afternoon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> morning, morning was fine. Saturday yeah. afternoon was all dicey. Well, you know, look how boring your Saturday would have been if you hadn't done that. Yeah. Your daughter would have been bored. She would have never found out yeah. how exciting it is to fly. Yeah, first time she flew with me, and she was hey, freaking out. Take her flight, <laughs> in, Jim. Uh, Pretty soon. I'll take her up in the uh, 182, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get that one back out. Okay, does anybody else have anything to share or talk about? It doesn't have to be an aero club plane. It can be, you know, one of your commercial jets that you fly. You know, something exciting. Like maybe a uh, stewardess told you you got somebody in the back of the airplane that's uh, gone insane or something like that. Bob has got a couple of stories on that. <laughs> so, okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. Aero club manager. Ha <laughs> ha. No, uh, decision-making, that's kind of like what our theme's going to be tonight. Okay, no Aero Club manager tonight. 
However, I am opening the floor for Mr. Mermot if you want to talk. It, this will be your last time, won't it? Maybe second to last time. Yeah. So I uh, decided to take a job over at, I think, an airport place in Hawaii called Becca. So, uh, yeah. I know. Yeah. So I won't be here to terrorize you with new procedures and restrictions on your operations. So <laughs> I'll leave that to the new airfield operations manager and the uh, air traffic team that um, we're still continuing on with construction on the keel, so I expect that to be done between mid to June uh, to late June. Then we'll swing over to text by Charlie and part of Alpha that, uh, that intersects with uh, Charlie. And so expect uh, Charlie and you know, Alpha and Young as well, obviously, but also the uh, runway 30 not to be used. We're going to close that as well. I uh, expect that to be probably not used for about five to six months as we uh, rebuild those taxiways. Then after that, the next phase is to do a small portion where Alpha turns uh, south uh, southwest bound towards our runway 32, uh, right in front of, in front of the fire department. That will close off and will be cut off from the runway. Once we go to that phase, you can get to the runway, uh, get the pre zero from Charlie, or if you want to go to the big runway, just go down uh, Charlie. Uh, but pretty much that's where we're at on the uh, construction. Uh, we're still uh, proceeding on with our airspace expansion project. We expect to have that done uh, by, I hope, by uh, November 19th. But there's some things that we need to do on small procedures that we are writing um, with agreements that we uh, work out with some company. Um, other than that, uh, you guys did a great job with the uh, propellers in front of your aircraft because the, uh, the entire uh, length of the green zero is mowed down. So they're <laughs> up there, so great job. Thanks for doing that. So, uh, but is there um, any issues with your space, services, anything like that? No? You guys are all happy? Uh, okay. Pilots um, are never happy, but you know. Sure. <laughs> so, happy to be happy, Joe. Yeah, probably. Yeah, you know, it's a little warmer there. Yeah. So, <laughs> but it's just something. Um, let's see. Uh, as far as operations, um, there should be some exercises next month. So just be aware that uh, you know, if you see a bunch of folks with flight suits running around, scared, or you know, in a hurry, you know, you'll get them doing exercises. So uh, next month is uh, exercise month. Uh, the board folks uh, will be here probably until the first week of June, and then you'll see a whole bunch of C-17s make the mass exodus back to the north. Okay, so. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, but other than that, you know, uh, enjoy. Uh, I'll try to get security forces to create new restricted areas so you guys can jack it up <laughs> randomly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Sure. Yeah, we need that. All right. John, do you have anything to say? Fly safe. Fly safe. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. I thought I'd give a quick briefing on what we got to do and how the airplane's coming around. You just brought that up to me. On the okay. Board, we got 5-5 five, five out there waiting on one Magneto. What's that coming to that seat check out? One day, two's in the hangar. We're trying to have that up by next Tuesday. And the latest probably next Thursday. But we get that pretty close to coming up. I just got a little after work. I know that uh, one five fox I understand the engine's being worked on, being built. I don't know when it's going to be done. Once it gets down there, it'll take us a couple of days at least to put it in and then finish up the engine on that one. That and, uh, Zero three, I'm not sure what you come up on that. Two nine, how they've been planning for each other. I was going to ask you about that, the, the number two radio, and that was, you could receive it, and they come here to you. On, uh, what's what's that? Two uh, nine? Two, two, two nine Fox Fox. That's comp two, huh? Yeah. Uh, Jerry called me about this morning. He, he was going to check it out. So maybe you should ask him if he had any problems today. But can you did say check out okay today for him. Okay. But, you know, I was down at Hammond and, and nobody was do, on the radio telling them, hey, I'm thinking about runway for takeoff and all that, and I couldn't hear anything. And, oh. and then when I got back here, Tara couldn't hear me either, so. Now, he said he, had, he got what you say. Yeah, I had to switch to number one radio. It worked fine, right? Oh. <coughs> one of those uh, weird things again. You haven't he told me it worked pretty good now. I don't know. So maybe you checked out the way. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's the only thing I know is Jerry never said a word when he got back, so. 
Yeah. We, we, I didn't hear which airplane you were talking about with the fuel. Was that the 182? Yeah, that's what I Yeah, okay. What, basically, what it's doing is <coughs> it's taking out of both wings, you know, the way it's supposed to. Right. But the ram air on the intake, the ram air for pressurized tanks, puts some fuel from the one tank back over the other side. So it appears like it's never used. It. But <coughs> it's, it's Did you, you don't have a good balance. Did you ever talk to the uh, uh, chief inspector at at Textron down in Wichita. I, I put Bob in touch with the guy down there, and I, I asked him some questions about that. He, he had a whole procedure how to, how to try to alleviate that. I have his name if you want. He said call one time. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Did you say that the 182 was still down for the mags too? No, the mags are in, just got to get an off check on the engine once I get out of the hangar. We've got the seat rail going in now, it's still pretty well complete. i got to put the cockpit together and then I want to do some electrical work on the lighting on the inside of the cockpit. Okay, so it won't be ready for my flight Friday. This ready? Yeah. <coughs> No, I can get up on jacks for you. You can make noise in the cockpit. Uh, I'll do something. <laughs> but it's too much. You can't get that airplane to go. <laughs> Mechanic humor. Yeah, I wish I could. Sorry. I'd like to have a safe one instead of a quick one. Okay. Uh, Randy, do you have anything to say? No. Nope. Nothing? Really? Uh, wow. Okay. I'll take the managers. Well, see, okay, I'll give Jim a kudo. He did a great job yeah. uh, not getting violated. As the, the potential was high. We were down in the, the last few, you know, all that class B airspace is joining. He was out there with the transponder that didn't work, getting yelled at by Tower, trying to talk to us, and trying to stay out of Miramar and still get the gear to come up. And did a good job. It's challenging. Yeah. 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 I didn't have any skills. The daughter will never fly with him again. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's the truth. Okay, all right. All right, uh, let's see. Well, yeah, uh, there's something wrong with that airplane. Yeah, so. Okay, uh, Okay. tonight what we're going to talk about is the goal of decision making. Um, uh, it's called doing the right thing at the right time. Uh, and most of you have been trained in this, I hope. For most of you students, you have too. For you new students, you probably haven't yet, but you will. Um, this is uh, this uh, problem with decision making for pilots. Oftentimes, is a big problem. Um, <clears throat> it's often the root cause for many aircraft accidents. As a matter of fact, they've got down here NTSB. Uh, this is from a uh, ten-year period. Uh, pilots, 74% of the all accidents were because of a pilot making the wrong decision. Um, fatal accidents was 77.9%. Um, maintenance problems is 15% and other unknown is 10%. So it's a pretty high figure for those, uh, you know, for a pilot making the wrong decision. Um, <clears throat> we know it as pilot error. That's what they call it. Um, this right here is just a real court, short little scenario that took place with our chief of safety for the aero clubs. Uh, what he did, and basically he did this takeoff from this runway that, uh, all the time. It was just a regular thing that he had always been doing for years. And um, he routinely has always done it, and nothing's ever been wrong. Uh, he puts down their complacency down at the bottom. About 1,500 feet into the takeoff roll, he realized that this takeoff was somehow different. I was lightweight. In other words, the airplane was pretty light, but was still at least 10 knots from rotation speed. I usually got airborne by 1,500 feet. And then, of course, he said those famous last words, I wondered if I should have worked the takeoff. 
he made it and he was able to debrief what did happen of course and he, and he was able to report it to all the aero clubs it was an fcif or <laughs> pif item for a long time um, he found that complacency is seldom something that happens overnight it's something that kind of creeps up on you uh, i know that every single one of us guys who've flown for many years know what I'm talking about. And you've come back on the ground with no event taking place, but you get on the ground and go, you know what? <laughs> Something should have happened there. But because I was complacent, it didn't, and fortunately things came together. But it doesn't always happen that way. Um, uh, he ended up making a poor judgment call, as he calls it. Okay. Judgment calls. Um, this story here I'm going to tell happened before I even started flying with the 141. Happened about a year before. And uh, what they did it was from Charleston Air Force Base, and they were flying to Milton Hall, England. And they did the pre flight on the airplane, but the radar failed. It didn't work. So they had to make a decision. Now realize this, this is back in 1977, in the mid-70s. So the atmosphere was just a little bit different than by the time I started flying in the 141. And, and, and you know, we, <laughs> you know, things were a little more intense making sure things worked. But back then the airplane was fairly new. It was a new airplane, you know, it was only a few years, but maybe 10 years old at that point. And so, they thought, okay, no problem. The weather says the weather's good all the way across the Atlantic, and the weather was good at, at the other end of Milden Hall. So they went ahead and took off with this. Well, to make a long story short, basically they descended into land at Milden Hall, and they started running the weather. And oh, by the way, it was nighttime. So they asked ATC for help. ATC, of course, back in the mid-70s, didn't have the radar they have today. And so they ended up flying the airplane right into the middle of a thunderstorm. And uh, it was one of the most catastrophic events that took place on a 141. Uh, it literally ripped off both wings and the empennage, and the plane just, you know, and it was amazing. If you read the report on that thing, they know exactly what happened by where the pieces were on the ground. I happen to know one of the guys that was involved going to that accident uh, years later, and he said they, they could figure out which wing came off first, and I don't remember which one it was. I think it was the right wing, then the left wing, and of course the plane was going in and of course it just went straight down and the tail came off. And they know this by the location of where all these pieces landed. And it's amazing, the accident investigations, how they can figure all this out. But needless to say, everybody died and uh, it was really a tragedy because they made the wrong decision. And uh, Devin and I over there used to fly together a lot, you know. And, and uh, we used to, you know, we'd run into some things like that, but by the time we were flying the 141, I mean, you know, no way, you did not go without any, any or no radar or any of that stuff. Um, it also happened to be the same day that a 141 crashed and killed everybody up in Greenland, too. Yeah, the exact same day. Uh, that was a whole nother story. So, so this was a decision gone bad. <coughs> um, Today, we had two students that came out to fly, and the decision was trying to be made, okay, should they go or not, okay? The first one this morning, the kid was doing a solo flight, okay? And he went out there, and he, uh, you know, at first, he thought, well, okay, I think it's okay, because all I want to do is go to Hemet. 
But he went out the airplane and then Jerry Rollis showed up and Jerry kind of talked to him a little bit and he made the decision, okay, no, I'm not going to fly. Later on this afternoon, Jason's student came out and was thinking about doing a solo flight also. But again, now Jason showed up and Jason, you know, basically you talked him out of it, right? Just say, okay, you're not going because... Well, it's more complicated because it was a, it's kind of a risk reward thing. You know, we always make those decisions. So it's Dylan, he has his check ride tomorrow. So he's going down to French Valley, kind of an airport he's not familiar with. So we, yesterday we did a whole bunch of landings there. So today he just wanted to dust some things off. There's a, there's a need there to go. And so in his mind, he really wants to go. But then he's looking at the weather and he made the decision to button up the airplane before I even got out there. Yeah. But him and I talked it out and it was the value of, and, and this is all aeronautical decision making, the value of going down there and flying circles for turns around a point in high winds with low ceilings probably is isn't worth the value of going home getting a good night's sleep and hitting the books a little harder so that's kind of what we talked out but he on his own made the decision to button it up and said yeah I, I don't feel comfortable okay. I'm not yeah. getting and I think that's the important part is is weighing things out and making the decision because you can't always just sit down and not do anything yeah but you have to say is is the risk reward equivalent there yeah. but I'm not compromising mine or other people's safety yeah and uh and, and thank you for that, because uh, I didn't know how the decision was made, but I, I know I saw you in the office explaining to him, you know, look, you know, just get ready for your check ride that's coming tomorrow. And, uh, and don't try to, you know, because your tendency, and I know all of us have been in check rides, your tendency is, is at the last minute you want to, gosh, I'm not sure about this, maybe I should check into this, you know. Most of the time it involves the books, but still, you know, you want to get out there and you want to make sure you do what, you, you want to do everything right. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things where you have a decision to make. And as we have here in the presentation, it's, it's they talk about here high time pilots. Okay, well high time pilots typically make a different decision-making process than a student does. Because a student now has learned it, and he's fresh in terms of what he learns, but the, you know, the pilot that's been around for a while makes a decision based on his, his experience, usually. And most of the time, you know, you, you sit there and you figure out, okay, it's kind of like that, like our chief safety officer, uh, he made a decision, actually he just got complacent in, what he, in his decision making. That's where the danger is for the old timers. A student tends to not do that because a student is very focused usually on making those decisions depending on what he's been taught by his instructor and of course what the books tell him. Weather is one of those, a big one. Here in California, we usually don't have the problem as back east does. Back east, they always have all that real weird weather sometimes that comes popping up. And, you know, it's one of those kind of things where, you know, different places, you know. Here in California, you get the smog here in Southern California. And uh, if you take off on a cross country or go up to Las Vegas and you're going to come back on a day that you know the smog will probably be bad here, it depends if you're IFR rated or not. If you're not IFR rated, maybe you better think about something a different alternate way. Um, the difficulty is recognizing the potential hazards and taking a timely action to avoid them. Um, the, uh, let's see. For this safety meeting, I mean, we could really get into this and it really, it, can, it involves uh, CRM, Crew Resource Management, uh, Civil Air Patrol calls it, uh, um, oh gee, now I forgot. It's a different terminology. They don't want to call it crew because, uh, because there's a lot of, they use the same method when they go up on the people that walk up to crashes and stuff. But, you know, here in the Air Force, they do have a risk management sheet that you fill out. And that sheet, determines if you're going to go or no-go. 
But even then, when you're using one of those sheets, even though it spells it out, the hazards, uh, you still have to make that decision as to what number you're going to put in there. I mean, how do you measure, you know, somebody who got eight hours sleep and the other one got only four hours sleep? I mean, right off the top, you'd say, well, the guy with the four hours sleep, of course, he's got to be tired, and so I'm going to give him a high number. But then again, how do you know if that guy isn't one of those kind of people who only gets four hours sleep every night? <laughs> you know, you could run into that. I mean, it could get very, very complicated. Uh, broadly speaking, basically what they did in the, uh, in the safety advisor that I got here, they broke it down into three uh, areas, big areas. There's, also, you, there's a lot of breakdowns in this too, but, but basically overall utility and ability and fun. Those are the three areas that NTSB is kind of narrowed down to as far as these type of accidents. Utility, that's where you fly the airplane to its limits. Um, we used to have a pilot that flew the C-141s they used to love fly the 141 to its limit. And the uh, crew members, especially the load masters and flight engineers, did not want to fly with the guy because of that. But he, you know, he was one of these kind of guys where if we were in a shooting war, I'd be the first one to volunteer because he would get us out of it. But in peacetime, was it really worth the risk? How many have seen that? I know some of you have. The B-52 that crashed up at Fairchild because the pilot was very aggressive towards everybody. Well, you know, okay. Uh, the individual I'm talking about wasn't quite as bad as he was, but he was <coughs> towards that direction. And uh, it's, uh, it's one of those kind of things where, you know, what do you do with your airplane? I know that those of you who own your own airplane, and some of you in here do, you know how that airplane performs, and you know that that airplane can do certain things. But even then, especially since you own the airplane, you don't want to mess up your own airplane, so usually you don't take risks that will crash the airplane typically. That's the, that's, but a rental airplane is another story. And a lot of people tend to want to, oh, well, you know, it's not my airplane, so they go down there and buzz over somebody's house. I can tell, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, David Mealy can tell. Hey, did you not see that scratch? Yeah, why is there a deer paw mark on the bottom of the <laughs> airplane? Uh, so, utility, the airplane, overloading the airplane out of CG limits, uh, I think for those of you who didn't see it years ago, Bob had a picture of an airplane that took off from Fly Bob Airport. No, Corona Airport, and Bob happened to be there, and there was a guy that literally had the airplane so loaded that the tail of, uh, it was a Cessna 182, I think, it, well, it was a 210, the tail was almost hitting the ground. And they were trying to talk him out of it. They weren't just standing by and watching them. I mean, they, they actually, I mean, he's got videos of it. And they were trying to talk this guy, don't go. Well, guess what? The guy went in anyhow. He took off, went to San Bernardino, I think it was, picked somebody else up, took off, and crashed uh, almost down to San Diego someplace and killed everybody. So, you know, it's, it's amazing what, what some people think your airplane can do. I mean, our airplanes are amazing. They really are. I mean, we really have some neat machines today. But I'll tell you, they, they, there's limitations to them. The other thing is ability. That's you as the pilot. Uh, what's your ability? Well, a lot of guys out there kind of get that idea that, hey, you know what? I know how to fly an airplane. Well, okay, true, you know, great, you know, but how well can you fly an airplane to get yourself out of a situation that you got yourself into that you should have never been in? So what's that old saying? Uh, your superior, superior abilities to fly an aircraft, uh, you shouldn't be using to get yourself out of a situation that you should have never been in in the first place, something to that effect. There is a saying, it's in here somewhere. Uh, 
a brand new pilot trying to land at LAX in your Cessna 150. I saw that. And I was at Vandenberg Air Force Base Aero Club many hundreds of years ago. And we actually had a student. He wanted to fly to San Francisco Airport and do a touch and go. Uh, yeah. Eventually, they finally talked him out of it. But he was really going to go. <laughs> yeah. Ability. Fun. OK, this is the other one where you go and buzz my house. Uh, I have a lot of people that do that, too, because I live in Banning Pass. And uh, <laughs> just the other day, there was a couple of two Cessnas flying right over the top. <laughs> Pretty low, too. <coughs> um, <coughs> you have to be careful, because there is an FAA examiner from the FAA that lives two houses down from me. Uh, so. That's enough said on that one. Uh, you can have lots of fun in an airplane without having to sit there and risk your life and anybody else's. Before you go, uh, this is the time to make those decisions before you leave the ground. Uh, uh, when you're not under any kind of pressure, often the conditions are really bad or really good. That's, that, that's easy. You know, you sit there and you look and there's a thunderstorm going on over your head and stuff and you just go, oh yeah, obviously I'm not going to go. Or it's a perfect, beautiful day. But where the decision becomes difficult is a day like today. Today was one of those days where, hmm, well, yeah, okay. It's about, the, you know, the clouds are about pattern altitude. Eh, yeah, I don't know. You know, that's when it kind of gets real iffy and, and some pilots just, you know, if you got, I want to go, itis, uh, oftentimes that's where people get in trouble. Um, and of course you got time, money, emotions, commitments, obligations, and as Randy put, said earlier today, you know, peer pressure. You know, you guys come out to fly the T-34s and, well, gee, you know, Don wants me to go, so I guess we better go. Or Richard, you know, uh, let's go, you know, or, you know, somebody makes a decision that kind of makes you go, it might push you over that little edge and might go when maybe you shouldn't. Doesn't mean you don't, but that's just, you know. Those are the little things. Before you go, continue. This is where you even make safety consci conscious pilots that get caught up in I got to get there. Uh, just say no. Uh, that's not as easy said. Uh, that, you, know, you, you can sit there and say no, but your heart wants you to go. So uh, what they suggest here is that you make uh, a permission to yourself to not fly the airplane. Uh, calculate in your time when you know you're going to go someplace that if you have to get there, then do it by, by giving yourself a permission to say, well, no, I'm not going to go, so I'm going to take a, get a ticket to fly there or drive to a place. Uh, several times we've had that happen with people come into the Aero Club to take the 182 on a cross country. They go in there and find out, you know what, the weather just is not going to let me do it. And, you know, okay, I got the car ready, let's go. Uh, it's a little more disappointing, yes, you know, oh gee, it's better, to, I like to fly up there, but you know what, it just, you know, it's better to get there and back than it is to try to fly up there and end up in a situation you wish that you had not gotten into. Um, get that airline ticket. So, you know, Southwest does have some good deals, sometimes. Uh, unlike the Air Force, Navy, Civil Air Patrol, we take trips, not flights, not missions, okay? Uh, Air Force, you know, when Gavin and I were flying the 141 and him with the C-17 later and many of you other guys that fly now, you know that when there's a mission, you're going to go. 
the chances of you not going on it is very, very small. Uh, I think out of the 28 years I flew the 141, I think that uh, at, at home base, I don't think I ever had it at one time where they actually canceled the flight. And even then, it was, you know, they still regenerated it again a day or so later. Now, when you're out in the field, you know, someplace like Timbuktu, someplace the Philippines or someplace like that, the airplane breaks. Now, you may not fly, but you're out, you're in the mission. It's still a mission, you still have to fulfill that mission. Here at the Aero Club, it's a choice. You have a choice of uh, our cameraman's leaving. Yeah, he's got other important things to do. Um, <laughs> um, so we, you know, don't don't risk it. I mean, holy smoke, we're here to have fun. We're not here to go out and fly a mission. You know, for you know, it's 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 that's why we're here. We love to fly. That's why we're here flying airplanes, and that's what we're here for. Not to go out and crash an airplane. So. <clears throat> Uh, okay, now, in saying that, realistically, of course, we all know there's risk in flying. Every one of us. And so, therefore, you know, if you're waiting for the perfect day to fly, or the perfect airplane, maintenance-wise, to fly, uh, David G. would never be able to do anything except work 24 hours 7. The weather is never going to be perfect. So that's why we have this thing called risk management, and that's what it's for. You know, because does the risk outweigh, I got it backwards, yeah. How to, does the fun outweigh the risk, or vice versa? And it's one of those kind of things where, you know, you, you just have to sit there and go, OK, I know, sure. The engine could quit on me. And I know that some of these guys, that's why we had a lot of problems with a lot of the 163rd pilots that back when we were doing chase plane with the uh, Predator, uh, there was guys there that would not, they did not want to fly airplanes because it was one engine. And they weren't used to that. They, they, want, they want more than one engine. And, and uh, I can remember a couple of guys standing there in front of my desk just saying, yeah, but I just don't like the idea of what if that engine quits? So it's like, you know, oh man, okay. So it's, you know, you are going to take a risk anytime you do it. But I've had guys, I've had students after they got their private pilot's license literally leave the club because they, the weather wasn't good enough for them here. And the winds were more than five miles an hour, and so they didn't fly. Well, yeah, okay, well, if you're going to be like that, then yeah, maybe you better get out of aviation. I'll let the guys from Accord. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think the guys from Accord will do okay, because down here it's not the same thing. <laughs> Up there, you know, you have that drizzle. And, of course, you might want to get used to flying in rain. You know, that's because you will run into that up there, which is fine. I love flying in rain. I think it's fun. <coughs> uh, it's a lot of, so. Okay, after you take off, of course, it doesn't just end. You know, a lot of times when you take off, you sit back and go, okay, I'm out of here. We're, we're ready to go. Well, yes and no. Uh, there are decision-making factors that you got to do while you're flying the airplane. All you old-timers know that. You newbies, maybe not so much yet, but you, but you will. Once you get the airplane up, you know, someday, you know, maybe you'll get to fly from here to Seattle one of these days. There's a lot of things that can take place in between here and Seattle, like the weather, uh, mountains, ranges. Uh, one of the biggies is running into a headwind and not have calculated it. Uh, and finding out that you're going to run out of fuel before you get to your destination. So what you got to do is that you got to break that chain that 
leads up to an accident. You sit there and go, wow, I got more stronger headwinds than I thought. So therefore, you know, you calculate it out and find out that you're not going to quite make it. So obviously, you're going to have to land someplace else, uh, a diversion of some kind, a different airport. And those are the kind of things you got to be thinking about, and continually thinking about the decision making. You still have to make those decisions. Be situationally aware. Active decision making process is made up of anticipate, recognize, and act. Okay, anticipate basically what it means. How many here know where they're going to land the airplane? if you lose your engine on taking off on 3-0. Randy does. Anybody else? Yeah, I'm sure John does. Yeah, if you, there's, you know, know where you're going to put that airplane because you're not going to have time. Uh, I got a video that interviews a pilot in an airplane where he had uh, he had like, uh, I think he had 5,000 hours, the guy in the right seat. The guy in the left seat had like 2,000 hours of flying time. They took off the engine quit. And, and, and of course they made it, of course, or else they wouldn't have been able to shoot the video. But he said, all told, to make the decision and got the airplane on the ground from the time the engine quit, it was like 1.5 seconds to make that decision. They got the airplane down, bent the propeller, of course, messed up the undercarriage of the airplane, but you know what, they walked away. So um, there are some gross vi um, videos that you can watch where some others didn't. It was taken by some third party. They got a picture of an airplane that lost an engine on takeoff and hit a telephone pole and right next to, they tried to land it on a road, right next to it was this open golf course. So, you know, now, you know, we don't know all the circumstances. You know, maybe he couldn't make it to the golf course. We don't know. But it did kill one person in that airplane. There's a story and stories after that. Uh, so, you know, think ahead. What, the one, and one of the things that, you know, it sounds negative, but you know what? Think about the worst case scenario. Every time you fly, think about the worst case scenario that can happen to you. 99.9% .9 of the time it's going to become not there and it's going to be a wonderful flight. But you as a pilot in command, it's up to you, especially if you've got passengers, to get those passengers to where they want to go and alive and well. And if you think ahead, at the very least, you have a fighting chance to survive any kind of a situation that comes up. Any questions so far? And of course one of the ones that's recognized the situation when it does come up, okay? Uh, there are people that have crashed airplanes because they just kind of let it go thinking it's going to get better or, oh, I can make it. Uh, no, that doesn't necessarily mean that's going to happen. One of the things they suggest in this article, if you have to bend a frame or bend an airplane to get you to get out of it safely, do it. You know, uh, AOPA or no, Flying Magazine had an article years ago, and I haven't seen it since. Only one time where they talked about people who own their own airplanes versus those who rent. And they found that back then that those who own their own airplanes tend to get themselves in trouble because they don't want to crash that airplane that they own. And people who rent airplanes tend to get out of a crash because... It's a rental! It's right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things that you, you've got to sit there and go, okay, you know, I, got, I want to get out of this. 
uh, let's see. And then, of course, act. If you have a problem, don't just hesitate. You've got all kinds of help out there. Holy smoke. You know, even if you're up there playing solo, you know, you got ATC, you got our tower here, you got, you got all kinds of people to call on that radio. That radio is your source when the radios are working. Uh, the radios. I heard, I heard you perfectly from the house when he called emergency. Uh, oh, did you? I did kick in a couple of times I could listen to his uh, emergency. Yeah. Emergency yeah. Kind of nice. and, and don't be afraid to call an emergency if you're in a situation where you, especially if you're new to flying and you don't quite totally know what's going on. Don't be afraid to sit there and tell ATC look, I'm a student pilot, or look, I'm new to this, I don't know exactly what I'm doing. Doesn't mean he does, but what he can do is he can encourage you. And believe me, there are tapes of, of listen to, and it's really neat to hear ATC, they really do care. And they do get on that, and they would, they, I've seen them, or heard them, you know, comfort the pilot to the point where the pilot really settled down. I listened to uh, uh, Jason the other day on his debrief of one of the students, and he was talking about dis radio discipline. And it got to the point where he said, look, if you're having problems remembering what the discipline is, just talk normal. Just tell ATC in normal language, just get it out, and uh, they they'll help you. Yeah. And, if, and yeah. if you don't mind me just stepping in a little bit more on what you're talking about here, um, the big thing these days is, and I briefed it already, is loss of control and flight. The big thing with that is the shock factor. When something happens and you get shocked, you got to have your wits about you. So the more you, in, in along with along the lines of what you're talking about. <laughs> Roger, is the more you think about these things that could go wrong, the less of, it'll still be a shock, but the more you'll be able to react to the, the emergency that's, that's going on. Uh, yeah. Uh, in a crew airplane like the Air Force or commercial jets, you got a crew sitting up there. But when you're in that Cessna all by yourself, you know, it, it can sometimes, that fear factor can be a little bit higher. So get that other person in the cockpit with you by using that radio. That's, that's one of those things. Uh, for you new guys, you know, someday you want to buy a handheld radio and have that with you. And uh, because you may lose calm in the airplane, which does happen quite often, actually. So that's one of those things you might want to have someday. Put, invest in one of those. Okay. Uh, Let's see, da, 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 the seriousness, overall, let's see, continue, oh yeah, the big thing is, uh, no matter what the situation is, continue flying the airplane, flying the planned flight, continue flying but with deviations and land as soon as possible, even off field if necessary, that's in an emergency situation. Uh, let's see, da, da. and it talks a little bit about how serious it gets. Okay, debrief, real quick. One of the reasons why Air Force and Navy and those guys can throw a kid right off the street into a high-powered jet uh, is, is because that's always been the question. How come you can train a guy off the street and put him in a in a F-16 uh, and then but have another student go and put him in a Cessna 150 and they have lots of problems. Well, one of the things that I found all the years I flew for the Air Force is this right here, debrief. It's uh, one of those kind of things where you sit down and you talk over the flight. Uh, one of the things that we used to do in the 141 was that uh, we used to have a good pilot would go back there and says, okay, let's talk about what we did on this mission. And it would be everything from the flying of the airplane to just plain old how was crew rest, uh, how well did the aircraft commander do. Uh, but a lot of your talking about what you did, you students are getting it now with your instructor. But after you get your private pilot's license, we tend to just, oh, okay, I don't have to worry about this instructor guy anymore. Now I can do what I want. Well, yes, uh, you can. 
But I'll tell you, if you sit down and critique yourself every time you fly that airplane, the T-34 guys do it all the time because they're flying close formation, so they need to. But that's how you prevent an accident later on down the road. You know, I screwed up here, I made a mistake here, or I did fine here. Okay, I gotta remember how to do this and write it down. Don't depend on your memory. Don't, don't depend on that. Write these things down. It's stuff to go over and brief your, debrief yourself on your flight that you just did. Think about it, what you have, what happened. And that what makes the difference between a guy who becomes, who's a good pilot and a pilot, a pilot just over the years gets complacent. <clears throat> and we talked about emergency. Again, we, this is the same thing. Uh, emergencies, the biggie right here is that right there aviate navigate communicate that's the order no matter what no matter what whether it's an emergency or not even when it's just a normal everyday flight aviate navigate communicate i know we want to jump on the radio you know when atc calls us and there are times when you should when you're flying ifr because they want you to answer back because it does make a difference sometimes if you turn the wrong direction but when you're flying out there at VFR, holy smoke, you know, that communication with ATC, it's, it's the last of the three. Fly the airplane. Fly the airplane. Many, many airplanes have crashed because they forgot number one. <sighs> know your minimums, and that's you, yourself. You students, you know, you guys have never flown yet, so you guys are really are limited. <laughs> You know, a couple of you have about a couple of hours of flying time, maybe. Uh, you guys that have 10,000 flying hours, you know. You guys, you know, you're, you have a minimum that are different than what a student has and anybody in between. Know what your limitations are. If you know that you can land the airplane with 25 gusting knots, crosswind, and you know you can do it, well, more power to you, but don't exceed what the book says. Because if you just ding a wing tip and they find out that you flat tr flew an airplane that way when the book says max cross is 20 knots, then you might be in trouble. But, so even if you can handle it, maybe you better not fly it that way. The C-141 was 25 knots crosswind. Any questions? Okay, this is a real quick. Uh, I, I forgot I had this one in here. This is from AOPA. There will always be some risk of flying, and it's possible to encounter a problem that you could not have foreseen. Such situations, however, are statistically rare. If you pay attention to the things that are most likely to cause trouble, like the weather, maneuvering flights, crosswinds, and so forth, and then handle them in a timely fashion, you are unlikely to become a statistic. So, with that, I'm done. Any questions? No? I got okay. A yeah. How come three minutes over and Bob wasn't here tonight to speak? <laughs> well, that's because Mr. Marimoto's talked, and then you had Randy, and then you had John, and yeah, it wasn't my fault. <clears throat> so, don't forget to sign the sheet. Um, next meeting is 21 May. Okay? 21 May. The Tuesdays just happen to work out just right where it makes it later. So, <clears throat> all right.